All right, so here we go. Um, so vertical line tangents also don't exist at that point. Okay, so um, I wanted to, this is a great example, this square root of x example, because it's a function that's continuous. The limit exists at every point, but it's not differentiable. And um, we're going to think of a theorem that's kind of related and somewhat similar. Uh, let's see what that theorem looks like. So theorem. If f is differentiable at a, then f is continuous. All right, and this is a wonderful theorem because the reverse isn't true. It only goes one direction. It's not an if and only if. For instance, if a function's continuous, it's not guaranteed to be differentiable. We just saw an example, right? The square root of, or the, the absolute value of x is not differentiable. So I'm gonna write that because I think that's important. So note, if and only ifs in theorem means we can go both directions. So this is not an if and only if situation. If and only if means we can go backwards and forwards. But this one, we can only go one direction. If f is differentiable, then f is continuous. We cannot say if f is continuous, f is differentiable. That would be going backwards. Okay, so moral of the story, um, continuous doesn't imply differentiable. Continuous doesn't automatically mean Oh, okay. Doesn't always mean differentiable. All right, and we just saw with the absolute value function. A function is not differentiable at corners. Okay, so we're gonna prove this. And we haven't seen a formal proof yet, so this is um, this should be fun. So here's what a proof looks like. So in a proof, you assume the hypothesis. And the hypothesis of the theorem is that f is differentiable. So we're going to choose a function f, and we're going to let it be differentiable. And this is a real proof. Sometimes we convince our things by examples, but this is an actual proof. So we're going to be doing it for any... Um, differentiable function at a. And as a side note, we don't write this as part of the proof, but since it's our first time, let's write it out. We're going to want to show it's continuous. And remember how we prove something's continuous? We'd want the limit as x approaches a value of f of x to be equal to f of a. Okay, so let's see, let's see what this is going to look like. We're going to see the language of proofs. And again, I would never ask you to prove this on the exam, but as you guys are going through your calculus series, you're going to start having more and more exposure um, to these proofs, okay? All right, so, um, well, we're assuming f is differentiable at a. That's all we have. So we can say, since f is differentiable at a, what does that mean? Well, by definition, that means the derivative at a is equal to this limit definition. And we're going to use the limit definition with as x approaches a, because that's the one we use in proofs. All 
All right, so what we're gonna do now, so we got that from our assumption, we're gonna fool around with this part. All right, f of x minus a. So what does the numerator equal? So f of x minus f of a, is equal to this, right? And we're just gonna do some algebraic magic to make it look like that argument. So if we wanna make it look like this, if we're dividing by x minus a, we have to balance it out. So what balances out division? Multiplication, all right? So now we haven't changed it. We divided it by x minus a, but then we multiplied it by x minus a, so there you go. So that's our motivation. We want to try to make it look like the limit argument, and we just did that. Okay, so we're going to take the limit of both sides. We have a theorem that tells us we're allowed to do that. Okay, so we're going to take the limit as x approaches a of this side and the limit as x approaches a to the right. Hmm. Okay. And we know um, when we have a product like this, we can separate out our limits. All right, so we'll take the limit of the first expression and then we'll multiply it by the limit of the second. Oops. All right. It's so like that. This first one we defined up here. That's just going to be f prime of a. And now what about this? What's the limit as x approaches a of x minus a? Well, a is part of the domain, so we can plug it right in. And a minus a is 0. Anything times 0 is 0. All right, so that means let's bring down um, this expression that we are working with. That means this limit as x approaches a of f of x minus f of a is equal to 0. Okay? All right. Um, let's manipulate the left now. We'll distribute that limit. That's one of our limit laws. All right, and now um, time for a little bit of algebra magic. So, well, first of all, f of a is a constant, right? Once we plug in a number to a function, that it gives us a constant. And we know we can take the limit of a constant. It's just going to be the same constant. So that's just going to spit out f of a, which is good, because remember, we want to show that the limit at a is equal to f of a. And we've manipulated that quite nicely. We have those two parts of what we want to show. And you add f of a to both sides, and that's exactly what we get. So we wanted to show that because now that shows that the function's continuous. So what we did in that proof is we said, let's assume the function is differentiable at a. And only using that fact and other theorems, we built on that fact with other theorems, and we got to the definition of continuity. So we were able to show that the function is continuous at A. And when we're done with the proof, we um, there's different things that you can write. You can write like QFE. Um, I like to do a, a square that I color in. So there you go. Okay, so um, some final things in this section we're gonna be looking at higher derivatives. Higher derivatives.
Okay, so for instance, taking a derivative like f prime of x, but then taking the derivative again. All right, and in that case, we would write it like this. We would write two dashes, and we call that the second derivative of f. So second derivative um, of f. Okay, um, that's one notation. You know, we also have our Leibniz definition as well. So if we wanted to take the second derivative, that would be like d dx of a function. And this time the function we're taking the derivative of is a derivative itself, right? f prime of x. So it looks something like this. So d dx of... Um, the first derivative, df dx. And this is how we're going to do it. So notice we have two d's <laughs> and we have two dx's. So the second derivative is going to be written like this. And we can keep going forever. We can talk about the third derivative. Um, we can talk about the fourth derivative. Um, but normally after four derivatives, instead of writing four dashes, we'll just write the four like that, like parentheses four, like an exponent. Um, and you can take whatever derivative you want. All right, you can take the thousand and first derivative. And it's just going to keep going and going and going. Okay, so um, we'll practice finding higher derivatives in just a second, but a great... Um, application of higher derivatives is going back to that position function. So the position function, we've worked with that for a little bit. Here we go, position function. S of t. And we know that if we take the, in, or excuse me, the derivative of the position function, we can get the instantaneous velocity. We saw that all the way back in 2.1 and then a little bit in these last two sections. So if we take the derivative of s, we get the instantaneous velocity. So like that. Um, we can call it velocity, we can call it the rate of change in, in the position. Velocity is a rate of change of position. So this is our velocity function. Um, we can take the second derivative of the position function. So now we're asking how quickly is the velocity changing? What's the rate of change? Hold on, let me write those notes because I think that's important. Let me write it up here. Velocity is the rate of change of the position. Because that's what a derivative is. It's talking about the rate of change. And so when we take the derivative of the velocity, that's the rate of change of velocity. Does that sound like anything you know? Oh, what are you doing? Rate of change of velocity. So how fast are we changing our velocity? That's acceleration. And uh, the function we use for acceleration is a. So we're looking at a of t. <coughs> and then finally, we can actually look at the third derivative of the position function. Which is like the double derivative of the velocity, which is like the first derivative of the acceleration. And we call that um, j. And again, it's the rate of change of acceleration. And I like to think of um, when we're changing acceleration, 
like when you are at a stoplight and you stop and then when you push your foot on the gas pedal, your acceleration rate changes. And what does your body do? It jerks back. Likewise, if you slam on the brakes, you're changing the rate of acceleration. If you're speeding up and slowing down really quickly, that's a change of acceleration. And what does your body do? It jerks forward. So it's called the jerk. <laughs> there you go. So if you wanted to uh, secretly insult your friends, you can say, you are a third derivative position function. And you can laugh and laugh and laugh and they don't know why you're laughing. Okay, so tally-ho. Um, let's practice finding higher derivatives. Let's go back to that example that we were already doing. Okay, so um, f of x equals root x. Using the limit definition, we said the first derivative was 1 over 2 root x. Yes? And now, doing that, we could use that to find the double derivative. Okay? And we'll, let's just set it up. We won't, we won't um, go through it because it's going to be a lot of, you know, like clearing denominators and multiplying by um, conjugates. And I know we can do it. It's just more tedious. You can practice more in your homework. But the setup would be the same, right? So we'd really just have to kind of look at this problem, write it in a different color because it's kind of more like a note, as the derivative of... The derivative okay so when we write our limit instead of f hold on let me write f prime in front of it so f double prime of t oh geez louise let's fix our variables too okay here we go All right, so when we're writing it like this and we're doing our limit definition, we're really going to be using f of prime of x plus h minus f prime of x because it's the double derivative, okay? And that's going to be your double derivative. So when we plug everything in, we have to make sure we go to the first derivative, not all the way back to the function. And again, that's all about the instructions and why we're trying to find that. All right, so again, it's all about the instructions and they ask us to find the double derivative. All right, and so that's the setup and then um, it'll be up to us to just plug that in or we plug it in, but to simplify it, and it looks like uh, we can multiply by the conjugate since we have the square roots, and we probably have to do some clearing of the denominators as well. All right, so that ends your section uh, 2.8 and chapter 2. So our next video, we're going to start in um, chapter 3.